If you would open your Bible to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is in the New Testament. If maybe you're new to the Bible, you turn almost to the end and you'll see a, a lot of books with strange names, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and then Ephesians will be in there. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. We're going to look at a, a single verse this morning. A single verse that is packed with content. Actually, I was talking to Aaron earlier this week, and even though we're only looking at a single verse, I was just confessing uh, <laughs> how much there is to say about the topic that this verse speaks to. As you know, if you're a member of our church, we have been going through a, a series called Gospel Community, studying what it means to be the church, to love one another as God has loved us, to, to be this this organism, this institution that's been set apart from the world. And, and this morning, I wanted to, to start to make the move towards giving some, some practical application for what does it mean to love each other? We've talked about how we're called to love each other, but what, what are some specifics, specific expressions of loving one another, of being the body, of serving one another in our unified diversity, as Aaron spoke to last week? What does that look like? Well, let's read this verse, and then we'll, we'll jump into studying it this morning. Chapter 4, book of Ephesians, verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace. That it may give grace to those who hear. A verse well worth memorizing. When I was in college, <laughs> I was a complete novice when it came to food, nutrition. It hasn't actually improved that much, but it was truly pathetic back then. Uh, there are days where uh, my midday nourishment would consist of one of those large pretzels with the blocks of salt that are just placed, you know, around it, and that would be like lunch. And if I was, you know, feeling really hungry, I might grab a soda or something. So, you know, a Coke and a pretzel, a salt with pretzel attached is not, you know, it's not ideal nutrition. So then I got married and my wife began to explain this new concept, which was new to me, that food actually has an impact on your health. It's a totally new concept. Uh, that if what you eat will actually affect you in particular ways. <clears throat> I thought, well, that's fascinating. I grew up with two brothers. Our adage was something like, if you don't eat fast enough, you'll be hungry at the end of the meal <laughs> because the other boys will take what's left and you won't get any. This is news. Uh, food has an impact on your health. And it, it does. I found that to be true, that what you eat actually affects your health. It's amazing news flash for all of us. Well, the same is true of our speech, except we have a responsibility, like my wife has taken with me, and like many do for their career, to be a nutrition of the soul, a dietitian of the soul. We are responsible for the intake of a particular diet that our brothers and sisters in Christ are called to receive. We have a responsibility, and what they hear impacts their health. That's the teaching of this verse. It, it, it lays this incredible responsibility on every Christian to be a nutritionist for their brothers and sisters in Christ, to be concerned about their spiritual health, about what they eat, and in this case, what they receive through their ears. We're going to talk about words this morning. Words. And the teaching of Scripture and of the New Testament is that our words must build up the body of Christ. Our words. Our words must build up the body of Christ. Verse 29 is part of a larger section of verses that is applying what the first three chapters of Ephesians have been talking about, that the grace of God has come, it has 
save people who used to be rebels, who used to be running from God. It has turned them around. And not only has it turned them around individually, it's built them into a community. That former enemies are now friends, that formerly disunified sectors of society have been brought together in Christ, that they've come together to form this, this, new, this new identity, this new society that's, that's claimed and identified by Jesus Christ, that's headed towards heaven. That's what he's been talking about. And then chapter 4, he makes this turn and begins to say, well, what, what do you do now that you're a part of that new identity? What do you do now that you've been saved? How do you live in this new communal identity saved by Jesus, indwelt by the Holy Spirit? How, how do you live? What does it look like? And he has a number of very pointed verses, all attached to the great work of the gospel. It's very, very important that we see verse 29 as attached to everything that's gone before. This is a command, but it's a gospel command. It's a command that's attached to the great engine, the, the momentum of God saving sinners and building them into a community. So this is not just a, a verse about, hey, watch your mouth or I'll wash your mouth. Okay, that's not what this verse is saying, okay? That's not, the, that's not the goal here. The goal is to say, look, because Christ has transformed you, because you're being built into this cosmic community, Things into which angels long to look have been attached to you. And now, what does that have to do with your mouth? That, that, that's the connection. This is not just morality here. This is, this is new life. This is transformation. This is bearing fruit from the eternal seed of Christ that's been planted in your heart. That's what he's doing here. And when it comes to words, he says, our words must build up the body of Christ. God has so arranged the church so that the church cannot, is not intended by God to live its life in isolation. Christians are not intended to need no other Christians. Actually, quite the contrary. To reverse this verse, we could say this. Without other Christians edifying words, you would starve. We have a calling to be a nutritionist, a dietitian of the soul through our speech. We speak, they hear, and they are built up. And that's a calling on every single Christian. Our words must build up the body of Christ. Christians must demonstrate their salvation through their speech. My speech must reveal and reflect my Savior. My words must build up my fellow Christians. Now this verse breaks down obviously, into two sections. Things we should never say and things we should only say. There's the never side and there's the only side. You, you can see that looking at this verse. Really, really, when, when you're doing uh, exegetical preaching, all you're trying to do is describe what's already there. You're not trying to put anything into it. So you'll, you'll see that. Just look at the grammar there. Let no, but only. Very simple breakdown. So I have two points. <laughs> two points. First, don't speak poisonous words. Don't speak poisonous words. Let no, Paul says, no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Let no corrupting talk come out of your words. Don't speak poisonous words. Th this is what our speech is never supposed to be like. Paul's categorical here. Never, never supposed to be this way. The word corrupting there in the original, it, it could have this idea of, of rottenness, of rotten fruit, something that has gone bad, you could think here of the old man, the old flesh, our nature that still exists, though we've been saved, and it bears this kind of rotten fruit, this kind of negative, dangerous, sinful speech that comes out of this old flesh. We, we bear the fruit of the old flesh, though we've been saved, and Paul says, don't let that come out of your mouth. No poisonous words. Now, in light of what he's been saying to this point in the book, we, we, we shouldn't have to think too hard about what overtly poisonous speech is. I mean, anything that contradicts the truths of the gospel of God that calls evil good and good evil, that rejects the whole salvation by grace alone, truth and teaching, that rejects the deity of God, the deity of Christ, that rejects the, the very nature of eternity as being under God's purview, anything like that, Paul's saying, well, yeah, that's, that's the old order. Don't let that kind of speech come out of your mouth. Surely we would have none of that in the church, he would say. Anything that would be corrupting, poisonous. Just as we would assume someone that loves another person would, would not 
plant poison in their diet, and spiritually speaking, anything that rejects God's word wholesale is poisonous. So he says, not in the church. No poisonous words. Now, I think for most of us, that is an unlikely risk that we would overtly declare to another person, God is not real. Jesus is not the only way to salvation. I deny the deity of Christ. I don't believe in the Trinity. It's possible that someone here could say that. And if you are tempted, don't. But more likely, I think, I think more likely what we do is something I would call friendly food poisoning. Friendly food poisoning. Let's imagine for a moment that you are going to host a great dinner at your house. And you're going to host all your friends here at the church. And in preparing your meal, you decide, I think we're going to do stew. I think stew sounds good. The weather's getting cooler. Stew would be excellent. And so you make your way to the local dump. And you begin pawing through the dump, and you discover there's leftover food that has not completely decomposed here. And you begin placing it in your sack and you take it home and you pour it into a big pot, some chicken maybe, and leftover pieces of cabbage, and there's, oh, and there's some nice blocks of cheese, and we're just going to place it all in this stew here, and we're going to stir it all up, and when they come, we'll just ladle it out. Now, when the people came to the house, it would have the appearance of food, wouldn't it? And you could probably douse that thing with enough spices that maybe even the smell would be okay. It would look okay initially. It might possibly even taste okay. I mean, you might be able to work some wonders and make that thing cover over enough. I mean, it might go down. They'd be polite. Friendly food poisoning. And then imagine a health inspector comes rushing in, having seen you, and says, these people are going to die. And then in defense, you say, well, it's food. It's just friendly food poisoning. It's not poison. It's food, after all. Let's not be wasteful. No, that's foolish. You're, you're going to kill these people. Friendly food poisoning, it may delay, but it will not stop the ultimate result. It may, in fact, make it more painful in the end. Friendly food poisoning. What are some friendly food food poisoning practices that I think take place in the church that, that ultimately do not obey this command. No corrupting talk, which includes friendly food poisoning. Not just overt denials of God. It's subtle ways in which we corrupt the people around us through our speech. Subtle ways, friendly ways, happy ways, Texas ways. What, what are ways that we can corrupt the people around us through our speech? Well, I think there's a couple of ways. Well, I think slander does this. Slander does this. Now, we all know technically that slander is wrong, but the little eye roll, the comment about a person's state and how they happen to be doing, that seems innocent enough. Slander is lying about another person. It's lying about them. It's allowing to be perceived or stating directly something that you do not know to be true. That is false. It makes it more difficult for the hearer to love that person in Christ. Gossip is friendly food poisoning. You're not overtly denying the deity of God. You're just exposing this person rather than seeking to help them. Gossip is explaining a person's weaknesses and sins, though they are accurate, out of a context of personal care for that person. It's talking about them without being with them. I think it's friendly food poisoning. It corrupts those who hear. What about expressions of surprise at a person's weakness or sin? You ever let that come out of your mouth? Why would you do that? I'm so surprised. I, I can't understand why you would do that. You're not overtly denying the deity of Christ, but subtly you're indicating that their sin is shocking and unacceptable and perhaps unworthy of patience and love. Why? Why would you do that again? 
shock at another person's weakness and sin usually reveals self-righteousness instead of affection, humility, and patience. It's corrupting speech. It's friendly. It's not overt, but it subtly undermines their confidence and hope in the gospel and in your love. What about speech that misrepresents God by only presenting half of his character? I think we do that all the time. This is friendly food poisoning, isn't it? I mean, this is not overt. We're not denouncing God. We're just emphasizing truth and not being so concerned about love. Speech that is truthful but not loving. That's friendly food poisoning. It misrepresents the gospel that has saved us. Truthful but not loving. Anybody relate to that? I'm just telling the truth. You got to tell them the truth. It's the truth. Yes, but it's not very loving. It's misrepresenting the Lord. Or what about speech that's loving but not truthful? You know what? I'm just about love. I'm all about loving people. Uh, yes, but they're in great danger. Uh, you know, I, I'm a loving person. Uh, that misrepresents the Lord. That could corrupt them. That could plant in their souls a false view of God. Truthful but not loving, or loving but not truthful. Now, in my experience, most of us tend to identify with one or the other of those. There's those of us that we, we're good with loving people, but speaking the truth when it's going to be hard, oh, that's difficult. Or, I get speaking the truth. We ought to be about honesty around here, but loving them when they struggle, that's really hard. I like the truth ministry. I like the love ministry. We like divide camps. Let's just all do our own thing. No, no, no. Our speech is to be representing the gospel that saved us. It's, it's attached to the engine of the gospel. God is truthful and loving. We should be too. Let no corrupting talk, let no mischaracterization of God come out of your mouth that could undermine their right view of who God is. Let that not come out of your mouth. Let a right view of God come out of your mouth. It represents who he actually is. You're united to Christ. Speak like it. Paul Tripp, the author, says this, truth that is not spoken in love ceases to be truth because it is twisted by other human agendas. Love that is not guided by truth ceases to be love because it is divorced from God's agenda. It's just friendly food poisoning. Hard to peg on the heresy scale, but easy to see how it undermines a person's spiritual well-being. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Paul Tripp, again, says this, we should be concerned about the thousands of hours of formal counseling that are not based on God's word. But we should also be concerned about the far greater amount of counseling that goes on every day between people who do not know what they are doing and people who do not know how much they are being influenced. If you are alive on this planet, you are a counselor. You are interpreting life and sharing those interpretations with others. You are a person of influence and you are also being influenced. In other words, if you talk, you're counseling. If you hear, you're being counseled. What Paul's saying is, no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, even if it's friendly food poisoning. The gospel community must reject poisonous speech. It must refuse to hear it. It must refuse to speak it. It must declare that the gospel has transformed us. That kind of rotten fruit shouldn't be coming out of our mouth, no matter how friendly it's packaged. Take a hard look at your speech, including the friendly poisonous category. Is there anything in there that could corrupt the soul of those that hear? Remember, you're a dietitian of the soul. God's giving you the job. You can't hang up that coat no matter what you try. That's your job. Every time you talk, you're fulfilling that responsibility. The only question is, are you allowing corrupting, poisonous, even if it's friendly poison, to come out of our mouths towards those who hear us? 
The body is intended by God to depend and receive from each other, just like the human body is. You cannot decide to be one way and not ultimately be affecting the rest of the body because God has built the body together. You can't decide to be a gangrenous kidney and not affect the heart. You can't decide to be a rotten foot and not affect the hand. The body is built together the way we speak, affects those around us, no matter what we think and no matter how friendly we say it. Don't speak poisonous words. Don't do it. Don't write them on Facebook or tweet them on Twitter. Don't blog them or post them or read them online. Don't speak them in a nice tone of voice. Don't say, God bless your heart at the end and assume that wipes them out. Don't do these things because it will ruin the souls of those that God has made to receive from us. No poisonous words. Not in the church. Not in the church saved by the gospel. Not in the gospel community. Second point. <laughs> Speak nourishing words. Speak nourishing words. <laughs> it's, it's actually sad to think how easy it would be to stop at that first command and assume we're doing great. Actually, I think many of us, many of us, assume because we don't tend to be slanderous or gossipy, we tend to be generally nice most of the time, that we are fulfilling our responsibility. Well, I'm not poisoning anybody. Well, it depends on your responsibility. If it's your job to feed someone and all you're doing is not poisoning someone, that's a much longer and slower but more certain means of death. Starvation ultimately leads to the same place that poison does. We need to feel the responsibility of this. The verse doesn't end halfway through. It is not just be nice to people, okay? Be nice to people. Stop being so mean all the time, bitter and angry and cocky. And No, no, no. It's, it's not just that. It is that, but it keeps going. You have a positive responsibility. You have a positive calling on your life. You're supposed to do something, not just avoid something. We need to feel this responsibility. God, when he made you a Christian, made you a dietitian of the soul for other Christians. That's what he made you to be. It's what he made me to be. He made them dependent on you. Speak nourishing words. This verse flows out of, if you look earlier in the chapter, there's this marvelous uh, passage in, in earlier in chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, where it says that rather than being tossed around by random doctrines, we are to speak the truth in love and thereby to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when, listen to this, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Do you feel the power and responsibility of that? How does the body grow? Well, ultimately the source is the Lord, but the means are Christians. The body grows through the body. The body grows as the body speaks. And so he's just flowing out of that to say, no corrupting talk. Look, you're the pipeline. Don't let any corrupting talk come out of there, but don't let nothing come out of there. Nourishing words. Speak nourishing words. The Christian is called to build up the body. It's called. He is called. She is called to build up the body. This, this verse, verse 29, is marvelous how it describes this nourishing speech. It says, it says it's to be good for building up, and we're good could be morally good, upright. There's a sense of rightfulness about the speech. And it builds up. It, it edifies. It increases. If we think of in the food category, it nourishes. When my, my little girl uh, was growing up, she used to talk to her mother. And the, her mother would say, look, some foods help you grow and some foods don't. I mean, trying to be simple about What's the difference really, really between vegetables and chocolate, you know? How can I explain this to you? Some food helps you grow and some food doesn't really help you grow, right? And she would explain that. Well, that's true in the Christian life as well. Some words help you grow. Speak those words. Speak the words that help you grow. Good for building up, it says. 
We're responsible for the spiritual nourishment through our speech of one another. This should be the reality in the life of the church. You should be speaking nourishing spiritual words to others. Let's just plant this as a calling over this week. All right, think, think ahead to this week. Who are you going to see? Who are you going to text? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to meet with? Where are you going to have FaceTime with somebody? In those interactions, you have a particular responsibility. It's a job description. Build them up. Speak words that will nourish them. Give them health. Br bring something that will help their soul become what God wants it to become. B build them up. You're going to have some meetings this week. Certainly husbands and wives are going to be talking this week. Parents and your children care group members talking together. You're going to have, you have a phone. You can call somebody, text somebody, tweet somebody, whatever. <laughs> You're called in that context, not just to get administrative details done, but to build up, to increase the soul health of someone. That's a responsibility that we've been given as Christians. It would be better for us to think of failing to do that as withholding food from someone that needs it. Of course, we wouldn't want to do that, but imagine if we did. Sitting down to lunch, okay, I'll just take that away, thank you. But I'm, I'm hungry. Well, I'm tired. Yes, but I'm, I'm hungry. I'm hungry too. Yes, but I need food. It's not my problem. Well, yes, it is. I depend on you to speak truth. God's made me that way. I cannot receive all the nourishment I need solely by myself. A Christian is incapable of receiving the nourishment they need solely by themselves. Starvation eventually will result. Good for building up. It also says, I love this phrase. Look down there at this phrase. I love such a great phrase. As fits the occasion. What a fantastic phrase. As fits the occasion. So, so build up as fits the occasion. What it implies is that there's many different occasions and types of nourishment that are needed for each occasion, right? Uh, this isn't just blocks of vitamins that we shove into people's mouth all the time. That there's different types. So food, I think, is a helpful analogy, right? There's different kinds of occasions. I don't know if you like steak or whatever your protein of choice is. Imagine if that's all you ever ate. On the other hand, imagine if you like carrots and that's all you ever ate. Or maybe you're, you're more of, you like, your speech tends to be more medicinal because people have problems and they need to be corrected with health, okay? And so you're, you're a medicinal kind of talker. And so you're always saying, you know, this is the medicine you need. And can I give you a diagnosis? And just fill this prescription. And that's your type of dietitian, right? You're a steak person, or maybe you're a carrot person, or maybe you're a, a pill person. You know, you, you really need this, this corrective word right here. They just pop this in. Thank you. Uh, who knows? I mean, the point here is that there, there's a need for a variety of speech. Just as in the human body, there's a need for a variety of nutrition. All of those types of things are needed at some level. But if you choose to only do one, you're not fitting the occasion, as fits the occasion, Paul says. I think this assumes that we got to become much more humble and servant-hearted at listening to people so that we can fit the occasion. <laughs> people that just lob truth at one another without reference to the occasion would be like a person saying, just, just tossing steak. Open your mouth, you know. Or just throwing certain kinds of food at your, in your direction. Here's what you need. I know, but I, I don't really want that right now. I know, but this is what I've got. This is what I've got. Yes, but you're not even hearing what I'm saying. I don't care. Here's what it is. I mean, you imagine if we did that in our homes. Hey, mom, I'm hungry. Here's spaghetti, you know, right on your head. I, I, I didn't want that, mom. Just shoving apples. Mom, I don't want any more apples. That's too bad. That's all I got. 
Sometimes we talk that way. People get half a situation out, and, and then you say, you know, the word says to walk by the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Uh, yes, but I, I was talking about my marriage. I know, but the word says, walk by the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He who does not have self-control is like a city without walls. Okay. I just want to talk about parenting. Blessed is man who's found in the walk of the Lord. And, you know, we just, we got our truth. My mother says, count to ten seconds every time you're angry, and that'll fix it. I think if we're going to fit the occasion, we've got to know the occasion. We've got to listen. German pastor, you may know this name, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He lived in Germany around the time of World War II, uh, faced incredible persecution. He says this, there is a kind of listening with half an ear that presumes already to know what the other person has to say. It is an impatient, inattentive listening that despises the brother and is only waiting for a chance to speak and thus get rid of the other person. This is no fulfillment of our obligation, and it is certain that here too our attitude toward our brother only reflects our relationship to God. It is little wonder that we are no longer capable of the greatest service of listening that God has commanded to us, that of hearing our brother's confession, if we refuse to give ear to our brother on lesser subjects. Secular education today is aware that often a person can be helped merely by having someone who will listen to him seriously. And upon this insight, it has constructed its own soul therapy, which has attracted great numbers of people, including Christians. But Christians have forgotten that the ministry of listening has been committed to them by him who is himself the great listener and whose work they should share. We should listen with the ears of God that we may speak the word of God. Are we listening? And having listened, do we have speech that can fit many different occasions? The Bible is full of many different ways of describing the same gospel. We should be too. Is this a moment to talk about the Bible? Or is it more of a moment to talk about the life that the Bible is meant to inform? Is this a moment to talk about conviction or about assurance? Is this a moment to talk about the pain of a fallen world or the stubbornness of a rebellious heart? Is this a moment for encouragement or correction, for intensity or comfort, for deep things or simple reminders, for celebration or investigation? If our tendency is to always bring the same kind of truth in the same kind of way, we need to consider how we can fit the occasion. Incidentally, this is part of the reason that we've structured our small groups in here in this church the way that we have. We have a, a family night where the family gets together and they eat together and they sit down and they talk together. Part of the reason we do that and don't spend the entirety of our meetings with more serious reflection is we want to know the occasion of people's life. We want to know each other. And that kind of relaxed setting, like we see in Acts and elsewhere, it seems to give occasion to find out what's going on in your life. What, what joys and sorrows are you facing? What, what's going on with your family? Let me get to, to know you, your highs and your lows, your struggles and your, your happy moments, your celebrations and your sorrows. I want to get to know you. It's to understand the occasions and to walk in relationships. So we say, look, those, those family gatherings, they're not superfluous. They're intentional on the counter because relationship is the context for effective speaking. I could surely communicate some general truth of Scripture to some brother I've never met, but the more I know them, the more fitted to their situation my speaking will be. The more I take time to know them, the more effective my speaking will be. 
And every Christian should have that same heart. I, I don't want just to lob truth at you, like a grenade that I'm sure will go off and hit you at some level. I want to fit truth precisely to your situation. What does this brother or sister need right now? Many things I could say. What do they need? Do they need to hear to the, the, the invitation of Jesus? Come, all who are weary or heavy laden, I will give you rest. Or do they need to hear that all those who walk away from the Lord Jesus cannot have confidence in their salvation? But what truth would most suit them? Do they need to hear something like Isaiah, that God who knows the ends of the earth also knows their situation? Or maybe they need to hear something like like in the Gospels where Jesus calms the storm with a word. Or maybe they need to hear a word from Ephesians about how God has blessed them with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Or maybe they need to hear a word from Revelation about how Jesus sits on his throne and the angels worship him and all things are under his authority. Or maybe they need to hear a word from Leviticus about how the holiness of God requires judgment for sin. Or maybe they need to hear something from Galatians about how you cannot earn your salvation. There's thousands of words that they could hear, but if we don't know the occasion, we'll just be shoving truth in their direction. Which means we need to build relationships so we can know the occasion. I want to know you, brother. I want to, I want to know you, sister. How, teach me what's going on in your life. Let me ask questions of you. Let me be like the Lord and be a good listener. If you're someone who loves steak talk, I have brothers and sisters, man, if they could, they would eat nothing but steak, spiritually speaking, all day long. I mean, it's like the deep things. I want to talk about eschatology and I want to talk about superlapsarianism. And this is what I want to get into, okay? I want to get into this stuff and just drill down. That's what I love, baby. This is when the good stuff is. That's fellowship, man. You're talking about serious doctrines and com- That's what I like. And someone says, you know, I, I was struggling with anger at a traffic light the other day and I, I really got mad at that person. Okay, have you considered the difference between antinomianism and, I mean, that's not really a stake moment. <laughs> There's other people that they, they prefer the lighter varieties. Jesus loves you. Yes, but I'm, I'm really struggling with doubt about the Trinity. Jesus loves you. I, I know that, but I, I, I'm doubting. The, I don't understand how he can be three in one. And I don't do that kind of thing, man. I, I like simple truth. Okay, but that's not quite my occasion right now. Does our speech indicate that God wants Christians to be always joyful and never serious? Always serious and never joyful? Convicted and rarely comforted or always comforted and never convicted? We're called to be dietitians of the soul, which means we need to develop ongoing growth in our store of truths to communicate and our ability to listen for the occasion so that we give the right word in season. That should be the fellowship of our church, the right word in season. Oh, that was, thank you for, you listened for 45 minutes and then you said that one word, that, that scripture, you pointed me to that one resource. Oh, that was perfect. It helped me so much. Thank you. As fits the occasion, and look at the goal here. Look at the goal. <laughs> that it may give grace to those who hear. That it may give grace to those who hear. What an ending. I mean, this is Ephesians, okay? So <laughs> grace is just packed through this book. It has been throughout this book, the grace of God that has saved people from wrath and rescued them from death and has brought them into a living relationship. I mean, it is just this magnificent word, grace, into which is packed. 
that. The good news of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for sinners and saving people from their, their destruction under the judgment of God. I mean, it's this wonderful word. And then Paul just slips it in. How should your words affect people? Like God's word does. Grace. Undeserved, unmerited blessing. Grace. I think this undermines a kind of comparison. Well, I don't benefit from their speaking to me. Why should they benefit? Well, because it's supposed to give grace, not wages, that it may give wages to those who hear, that it may give an equal return of what they've given to you, to those who hear. No, it's not supposed to give. It's supposed to give grace, unmerited favor to those who hear. It's supposed to reflect towards them what God has done towards you. What did it say earlier? That you're to be a conduit of the power of God. God who treats his people with grace chooses to reflect that grace in the speech of his people to one another. Let your speech be gracious the way God is. Let it bring to sinners what they do not deserve. That it may give grace to those here. This should be our heart. In the life of the church, this should be our heart. I, I, I want my words to give grace to you. I want it to give you grace and favor. I want to be a conduit of the same grace I've received. I want God's grace to flow through me and be given to you, not, not for your salvation, but for your upbuilding and your encouragement and your hope. I want my words to be a, a, a pipeline of grace to you. I mean, this is what James says, right? He says, brothers, can, can salt water and fresh water flow from the, the same stream? Of course, no, no, no. Of course, that's not what we want. Should blessing and cursing come from the same mouth? No, of course not. Should self-righteous sarcasm and kind encouragement come from the same mouth? No, it shouldn't. Of course not. Should silence and self-focus and encouragement and blessing and edification come from the same mouth? No, of course it shouldn't. Your mouth has been redeemed by the word of truth and grace. Let him speak through you. Let him speak through me to you. People are dependent. Without the encouragement of the church, the body would cease to function. That is not minimizing God's ultimate sovereignty. It's honoring God's design. That it may give grace to those who hear. One more type of application, and then we'll close. There is a type of Christian communication in our country. I don't think it's in many other countries as much because I think other countries suffer more than we do and they don't have time. Um, but in our country, it's present. And you might call this cheese puff conversation. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about light and simple edification, okay? I'm not talking about the very legitimate, simple word of encouragement. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about conversation that never references God at all. You might call it cheese puff. Now, I don't know what the nutritional value of a cheese puff is, um, but it, not much, okay? I mean, you're not going to be strong, healthy, and wise. Popeye was not eating cheese puffs, <laughs> all right? And spiritually speaking, if, if our conversation is normally cheese puffs, spiritually speaking, it's similar to a starvation diet, isn't it? Now, this is hard. I, I find inserting God into a conversation, we want to talk about practical things. Sports, how's the sports doing? And how's your car? Seeing your car broke down. How's your house? And you're mowing your lawn, and that's great. Now, th that's great for context. That's wonderful. That establishes the situation, the, the occasion, right? Okay, well, this is, my transmission broke this week, and I had difficulty with the garage, and they didn't want to listen to me, and this happened, and then my children didn't listen to me and obey, and we've had come trouble with our marriage recently. And, you know, that's great for context, but sometimes we want to stay at simply talking about life without God present in the conversation. It's like cheese buff conversation. <laughs> Man, interesting political race going on this year. Have you seen those Cowboys, how they're doing? What about the Spurs? I don't know. I like basketball. What about field hockey? I mean, we talk about all kinds of different life issues. But the soul needs God. And one way that God and the truth of God is brought to bear on the soul is through the speech of fellow Christians. So, 
if we're tempted to stay at the cheese puff level, let's add to that God. Let's turn the corner in a conversation. Can I encourage you that you're saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would that be an awkward sentence to include in a normal conversation with a fellow Christian? Can we just talk together about what it means for us to be saved for a few minutes? Now, if you're a steak person, don't get all excited right now. Oh, good, finally. We don't have to talk about occasions, right? All that last section was for you. But, but if you're a person that, that prefers kind of nice, not too offensive, not too deep conversation, it's supposed to give grace to those who hear. Not nothing. The body is called to build up the body. The Christian is called to build up the church with their words. Our words are meant to edify God's people. Our words are used as a conduit of God to bless and build up and strengthen his people. It's not a job we can resign from. We do not have to be articulate. This is not a only preacher's responsibility. This is every Christian called to be a conduit speaking grace into the life of their fellow believers. Let's do it. Let's do it. It doesn't require articulation. It doesn't require complex thought. It requires the ability to say truth to a fellow believer that will nourish their soul. Let's do it. Why would we not want to do it? What a great job. My children need food. Go feed them. God. What a great job. Words typically cost nothing but time and listening. What a great job. Whether it's in small group, whether it's right after the meeting, whether it's calling somebody, texting somebody, emailing somebody, posting something for somebody, checking in on someone. Let's speak. Let's speak grace into the life of our fellow brothers and sisters. We're a gospel community. We're a community that should be speaking the gospel into each other's life. One more quote from Paul Tripp, and then we'll close. He says this, Embedded in the larger story of redemption is a principle we must not miss. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things in the lives of others. Ordinary people, ordinary Christians, ordinary vocabulary, ordinary awareness of the word, ordinary background, ordinary maturity, ordinary Christians to do extraordinary things through speaking the truth of God's love in Christ to one another, listening for the occasion, and then bringing the nourishment that they need. Let's build a community of gospel-speaking fellowship one conversation at a time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the word that dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Thank you for being a speaking God that speaks and speaks and speaks, Lord, in, in so many different ways and different varieties for each possible occasion we could ever need. You've spoken word into that occasion. Help us to be the same. Help us to be a, a fellowshipping community, a community of, of words that speak grace, of, of listening that understand occasions. Help us to reflect you. Guard us from corrupting talk, Lord Jesus. And let us speak nourishing words gospel words to one another. Give us grace so that we can speak grace. In Jesus' name, amen.